So this book is called Uncomputable. And it's a, a book about the archive, about the history of the digital, the history of, of computation. And there are a lot of excellent uh, histories of the digital, but I wanted to kind of expand um, the time frame. So to go back to the 19th century, to go back even potentially further. But I also wanted to expand kind of the conceptual frame and look at artifacts, technologies that don't obviously appear to be computational, but might actually have a sort of informatic or digital or computational aspect. So that might include um, games, uh, which are frequently very rule-based and algorithmic. It might also include uh, textiles and weaving. Um, there have been connections made between calculation and weaving for a very long time, going back to Ada Lovelace and Charles Babbage and, and even further. Um, and so, you know, I usually write about theory and philosophy, but this book is really different. It's about going back to the historical archive, um, encountering strange, startling things, which is one of the joys of, of, of working in archives. And then, um, you know, accumulating enough of these stories to be able to tell a, a, co a coherent narrative about the deep history of the digital and the computer age. So for instance, in the 1970s, I, I didn't know that uh, the French situationist Guy Debord founded his own game company. Um, I discovered, uh, because of my art historian friend, Ty Smith told me about um, a textile artist in the 1950s who was using um, algebra to create computational patterns for, for weaving. Um, I hit upon a, a photographer in the 19th century who developed a technique that is identical to um, computer modeling. Um, so I was trying to kind of expand what we usually think of in terms of what a computer is, um, what the computer age is, go back deeper into the, um, into the archive and try to um, you know, supplement some of the existing histories of the digital and um, computation. The uncomputable is a, a suggestive term. It's a little bit um, uh, maybe sort of um, unusual term. Um, it does have a technical definition from computer scientists and mathematicians, particularly in the first part of the 20th century, people like Alan Turing and maybe in a different way, Kurt Gödel and Bertrand Russell and others were um, dealing with uh, and actually offering technical proofs for the limits to rationality. So things that cannot be computed or cannot be thought using discrete, discrete rationality. So there, there's that sort of a definition. There's also a kind of practical sense of what the uncomputable is. And here the best example would be um, encryption. So if you ask a, a cryptographer, you know, can you reverse a password hash? they'll give you a very practical answer. They would say like, well, maybe in theory you can do it, but in practice, you know, you'd need to run a computer, you know, like till the sun burns out or something for, for that to happen. So that's a different way of thinking about the uncomputable as a kind of practical limit. Um, but the version that, that I'm sort of dealing with in this book for the uncomputable is another um, way of thinking about the, the outside to discrete rationality. And that comes in a lot of different forms. There's a sort of woo-woo, hippie, mystical version of it. Um, there is, um, you know, the concept of intuition, which has a more or less rigorous definition in philosophy even. Um, in recent years, there's been a resurgence of interest in real materiality, um, a sense of, of some kind of a realm of, of perception, affect, experience that is somehow, you know, not reducible to discrete rationality. So that's the kind of threshold that I'm maybe focusing a little more on, this, this place where the computable and the uncomputable brush up against each other. In terms of sort of philosophical influences, you know, the last book I wrote, the subtitle was Against the Digital. So I've been trying to explore um, what it might mean to you know, sort of within the realm of philosophy to withdraw from a, a philosophical system, a, a system of, dis of discrete rationality. Um, 
But, you know, no philosophers were harmed in the writing of this book. This isn't really a theory book. Um, I'm focusing more on, on actual artifacts and trying to tell their stories. Um, that said, uh, you know, I'm hugely influenced by um, the concept of uh, multiplicity and the multiple in, in works from people like Deleuze and Guattari. Um, you know, the major theme of this book is the uncomputable, but the minor theme really is multiplicity and the, the media of multiplicity, right? Like media formats that rely on lists and series and arrays. Um, and so the, the bad news is kind of uh, that, you know, the multiple, you know, we think of maybe heterogeneity and um, contingency and those kinds of things, but the multiple is also a term of art within math, within arithmetic. You know, integers are multiples in, in the technical sense. And so I am, you know, kind of getting my hands dirty and, and, and addressing that sort of more technical side and thinking about media formats like bitmapped images, um, game boards, you know, chess boards, um, things that, that uh, rely on grids and lists and sets and arrays, because for me, that's really at the heart of what you know, how, how digital media are, are constructed. So something that's a, maybe a little bit unusual about this book is that it comes out of, um, uh, you know, um, typical scholarship, you know, digging in the archives, reading books, trying, trying to have, you know, intelligent uh, thoughts about them. But it, it also comes from uh, hands-on uh, practical activity. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a kind of amateur coder, I like to build things, and so there's sort of three main anchor points in the book where I actually um, had to make something in order to um, do the research and, and to actually write about it. Um, and the three are, are, are super different. So um, the, the first one is, is in section two of the book, which focuses on um, Ada Dietz, who was a retired um, school teacher. And um, she moved to California and wanted to kind of reinvent herself. And she developed this technique um, for, uh, for textile arts, for weaving. Um, she developed a, a technique to use algebra to um, create computational uh, weaving patterns. And it's, it's a kind of amazing story because it's happening almost at exactly the same time as you know, people like John von Neumann and others were developing um, some of the, the first um, digital computers. Um, and, and so in order to do that, I had to, you know, buy a loom and learn how to weave and, and, and essentially reenact or recreate these algorithms that are lost to, um, you know, lost in the historical record. Um, and so it's a way to kind of breathe in new life. It's also a way to kind of teach me through, 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 through doing and through action rather than just through reading and, and thinking. Um, the other, uh, the second sort of anchor point uh, has to do with that unusual figure, a mathematician named Niels Al Baricelli, who at almost exactly the same time in Princeton, New Jersey, um, developed a technique where he, um, uh, by his own, you know, sort of uh, uh, description, uh, created artificial living organisms strictly inside the memory of one of the first digital computers, a computer called the Electronic Computer, a uh, very um, uh, creative name, uh, that John von Neumann had created at the Institute um, in, in Princeton, New Jersey, um, Institute for Advanced Study. And so he, he comes over from Europe on a Fulbright and they, they say, well, you know, we, we need this machine for national defense during the day, but um, we'll, we'll let you have it overnight. So he would stay up all night and create these, these weird um, sort of kind of, he was trying to model Darwin in, in computer memory. So kind of genetic algorithms. Um, so that stuff is interesting, but what really got me about Baricelli is that in the archive, they preserved these blueprints that he created. So he made a nine foot tall digital print in 1952, which is pretty unusual. <laughs> uh, and seeing these blueprints, these, these digital images that he created of his weird living ecosystems um, made me want to recreate them. So read his white paper, wrote a little processing sketch, 
um, and recreated these, these beautiful graphical renderings of living spaces. And then the, the, the third one, which I've spent a ton of time on over the years, um, has to do with the French uh, filmmaker and author, um, member of the Situationist International, uh, Guy Debord, who, um, unknown to me at the time, uh, created a game sort of late in his life. And he actually founded a game company, which I think is kind of unusual for an avant-garde leftist figure. Um, and they released one game. Uh, they designed a second game, but they never released that. And uh, so again, I, I got the rules and then um, put together a team of, of artists, um, musicians and um, uh, graphic designer and, and basically ported this game to, to the computer. And so that's the sort of, sort of third element in this hands-on manual encounter with the archive. And I will say that like the, the, the reason to do this is that it, you know, it's a different form of knowledge, um, which I uh, appreciate and, and I'm drawn to, but I will say there are things that you learn uh, when you engage in practice that you can never learn otherwise. And I know that's just a truism, but um, it, it really is, is accurate in this case. Um, so for example, I discovered that um, Guy Debord in his book that he wrote with his wife uh, about the game, um, the book is riddled with uh, mistakes. Uh, and I never would have learned that if I hadn't restaged the algorithm, um, because frankly, the, the the debugger caught it for me, right? I, I couldn't have caught all those all those mistakes, and so those mistakes were kind of a thread that I was able to pull to sort of um, unravel this mystery um, that you know that surrounds surrounds the game, um, and that's the mystery that I that I that I retell in the book. So I, I, I first started working on this game, which, which Gita Board, on his title, he referred to it in his notes, in his, in his letters, um, as uh, the Kriegspiel, which is a sort of generic term from the age of Napoleon and Clausewitz, just the German word for war game. And then in the, the French title, um, he titled it the game of war. Um, so uh, I wanted to, you know, kind of, remain true to his, his rule set, but I also didn't want to get sued. So I, um, I'm using the, the other title, the, uh, the title is Kriegspiel and it's an unusual game. It's, it's sort of like a cross between chess and I don't know, risk or something like that. It's a, 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 a game where you play with little toy soldiers in a made up world. Um, there's a kind of great irony here. Um, I call it a kind of nostalgic algorithm in the book because the great irony is that um, it's really, um, for someone who is so committed to kind of militancy, right? Debord's name was, you know, festooning the, the pediments of French society in May 68, et cetera. Late in life, he makes this work that's surprisingly square, maybe even conservative or reactionary, at least, at least it's very nostalgic for, for an older time, a time of antagonism where you had, you know, sort of symmetrical battles that meet on a field and, you know, their, their regular uniformed armies, etc. cetera. Um, not the kind of asymmetrical antagonism that, you know, was happening all around him in the 1970s and beyond when he was working on this. So, so, um, you know, Debord was in love with um, the kind of raw glory of, of antagonism and, and, and conflict. Um, unironically, you know, um, he, he, he was in love with Napoleon, I think kind of un unironically um, as a military um, leader. And so he thought that this game would be, as far as I can understand it, you know, he thought that this game would really just be like a tool that would teach strategic knowledge at a very low level, right? So maybe this is a tool that would like, you know, teach a new generation of militants or something. Um, you know, he was also obsessed with toy soldiers. I learned much, you know, a few years later that his collection of toy soldiers are actually preserved uh, in, in, uh, in the archive in, in Paris, uh, you know, like in a little shoebox or something. Um, so, so yeah, this game is a kind of historical reenactment. Um, 
I don't know if that's the right word, but a kind of restaging of, of, an, of an algorithm, a, a set of rules, um, and then trying to understand how to um, deal with that algorithm as a sort of like political and, and cultural object. Marxists often talk about um, formal subsumption and real subsumption as sort of kind of two necessary phases in socio-cultural evolution or revolution. And I think the last couple of decades for, for digital media, society or whatever, are usefully understood and interrogated through, through that structure. And what I mean by that is, you know, when I first started doing digital studies, I think we really were still in the kind of formal subsumption phase, right? But with Web 2.0 and in, in the early 2000s, um, we moved, I think, you know, kind of firmly into the, the, the phase of real subsumption, by which I mean um, the, the, you know, the sort of the, 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 the structures and, and conceptions and premises of, of, of digital technology are now completely integrated into everyday life. Right, so that might be social media, but it's it's a lot of other things too. It's a revolution in labor practices, and you know supply chains, and all sorts of other things. And so I think that's that's a way to understand this this idea of a kind of golden age of digital studies that I think we're in right now. Um, there's just a quantitative observation. There's tons of interesting people working in this field, tons of interesting new books. Um, but I think there's also a sort of more qualitative aspect to it, which is, which is that um, the insinuation into everyday life of the machine is just, um, you know, kind of reached this hyperbolic stage. And so it's, it's exciting to kind of be reading what people are doing now. And um, there's also another kind of refreshing aspect, which is that I think work today is much more critical. Um, and I, 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 I welcome that. Um, you know, a lot more people on the left are writing about machines uh, or going back to, to writing about machines. Um, and that, as I said, is really refreshing given the sort of, you know, um, you know, sort of unabashed excitement of the kind of dot com era, which, which is, is so worn out and tedious at this point. So. Um, that's, that's what I mean when I say that we're in a kind of golden age of digital studies right now.